Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining me today, my esteemed swimming colleague, fellow swim coach, swim nerd, but but also we're not really in the same swimming league because he is an NCAA All-American. He swam at the University of Texas. He's an NCAA champion. Today, we're sitting down with JT Larson. How's it going, Coleman? going well i'm i'm very excited i i just got out of the kitchen i feel like i'm a little sweaty but uh i'm really excited to sit down and talk with you today jt hey it's Um, all good for 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 the i want to give our audience a little context you and i coached together uh for about for a semester at the western hills athletic club in austin texas uh you you finagled your way into getting class credit for for coaching with us i did i did so um when i i mean this was just a few months ago when i was in school but i was studying sport management and one of the requisitions to graduate was you needed to do some field work with a sport organization and that could have been you know a club team that could have been a high school team and it happened to be Western Hills. So it was a win. <laughs> it was a win. We were, we were there with Ian Crocker, Jimmy Bynum. There were, there were a few other coaches on deck. It's a great group over there. It was a lot of fun. It, <laughs> it completely beat taking credit for hours in <laughs> class. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we had a good time on deck, uh, but that's, that's where I met you. That's, that's how I have a, a personal relationship with you. And so, but we're going to talk about, um, we're going to nerd out on swimming today. We're going to talk about Texas swimming. You swam there for four years, but first of all, you were, you were a sport management major and now you have a job at Dell. How did, how did that Isn't transpire? That wild? <laughs> Isn't that wild? So, um, it was actually a Groupon deal. That's how I got the job. <laughs> no, but, um, so university of Texas, awesome, really cool thing about this, this school is we have such an awesome alumni network. Um, so if you're a junior, I think for sure, a senior, um, you can be a part of this Longhorn alumni, uh, group that was actually made by our athletic director, Crystal Conte. Um, and in that you, you kind of, they pair you up with someone who graduated an athlete actually, and you can put in like what you want. Like, do you want them to be in the same sport as you? Do you want them to be a male or female? What are your interests? And then from that list, they actually kind of pair you up with someone. Um, so right away, funny enough, just by luck of the draw, I got, uh, this gentleman by the name of Darrell Fick, um, and Darrell has been super awesome. Darrell's just been, uh, we met all year, just kind of discussing what I wanted to do. Um, and I think kind of coming into college, I had this idea that I wanted to, to be like a sport agent or be in the entertainment industry. Cause my dad's in the music industry. And, um, I think just being in Austin and being around Durrell and a ton of other alumni, I just realized there's so much more out there. And uh, the Dell opportunity kind of came around and I shot my shot and I got it and I could not be more happy. So that's congratulations. What, what will, what are you, or what will you be doing at Dell? Yeah. So I'm going to be an account manager. Um, so I'm going to be doing a lot of sales. Um, it, funny enough, it's actually going to be working remotely out of Tennessee. And this is kind of funny because, you know, Dell's here in Austin um, so I'm going to be dealing with a lot of companies that are anywhere between Texas and Tennessee, um, just kind of working with them with Dell equipment. And that could be, it, it literally will change day to day. And I'm just kind of a people's person and I'll be able to work with people, which I'm really excited about. Nice. Yeah, yeah. that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, I have to, I have to get this tidbit out there. You mentioned your dad's in the music industry. Could you, could you delve a little bit more into that? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm from, I'm originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, so many, many years ago before I was born, my dad worked for Prince, um, the musician and the revolution. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm leaving out jobs my dad did, but I mean, he kind of worked his way from the bottom. I think he was 19, 18 or 19 when he started. Uh, he said he didn't even get paid. Um, his only payment was he got to watch the concerts, but 
he worked his way up. I, I'm pretty sure he was a guitar tech for a while, but um, within the nine years, he became the, the chief tour manager, actually. So he worked for Prince for nine years in the revolution. And then somewhere in that, he went to uh, MC Hammer for, I want to say, two years, did some work with Boys to Men. So just a lot of, a lot of really cool acts. And then now he works for a company called Digico, uh, which is based out of Scotland. And if you go to any concert, any really big live event, um, maybe not even big, there's going to be like those giant mixing consoles that they got with a million knobs. Um, and my dad is the vice president of the company that does uh, most of the big acts, to my understanding. So, wow. yeah, that's kind of the industry that I thought I'd, I'd want to be in. And who knows, maybe eventually I'll find my way there. But yeah. That's the, yeah, I, <laughs> that was always there. That was sometimes the talk on deck of just like you, you telling a cool story about your dad and Prince and, yep. you know, that's, that's, that's just, it's really cool to hear. Um, yeah. And the, the older I get, the more of a, an appreciation I have for it than when I was younger. I'm, I'm guessing just growing up around it, you, you know, you don't know anything different, right? Exactly. Yeah. You're just kind of accustomed to it and it just kind of worked to you. you. You think that's what all adults do. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so, so as you mentioned, you grew up in Minneapolis, you started swimming and kind of, I want to start the swimming part of this podcast here because you were, um, you were a really good swimmer coming out of high school. Obviously you, you went to the university of Texas to swim there, but, um, what was, what was your experience being such a highly ranked recruit and taking, you know, recruiting trips to what you knew is the best schools in the country. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, at the time I was recruited, I don't think my short course times were really anything impressive. I kind of was developing maybe on the long course end. Um, so I was fortunate enough to get, you know, the attention of a lot of the bigger schools. Um, and I obviously recruiting so different than it was, this is funny, five years ago. Because yeah. like my class was the last class we like really took trips and we actually um, had to make that decision in four to five weeks. And, and when you take like trips back to back to back, that can be a little bit overwhelming. And some of them, sometimes they even start to blend together. <laughs> um, but for me, I was fortunate. University of Texas was the first trip that I took. Um, that was kind of a big deal to Eddie that I, that I came down the first weekend um, just because I mean, they understand the first trip is going to be the one that you remember the most. Um, and I think I just, University of Texas just really stuck out to me. It was actually University of Texas in Georgia. I kind of knew I was going to go either, either to one of those. Um, believe it or not, the re, one of the, one of, t- there's two reasons I came here. One of the reasons was many, many years ago, there was this, right when I started swimming, so probably seven years old, my mom had purchased this DVD. I don't know where it was came from. Maybe maybe a Splash magazine. I don't know if they make Splash magazines anymore, <laughs> but that was like a big deal. And there was this DVD called Unfiltered. I might have mentioned this to you before, but um, it depicted the rivalry between Michael Phelps and Ian Crocker. So in this, this documentary, it would be going back and forth from Michael's <laughs> life in Ann Arbor, um, Ian's life in Austin, Texas. And I saw Chris and I saw, you know, Eddie and I got to see Bob at Michigan, um, Urban Check, Phelps. So I kind of grew up having this this idea. I want to go to Michigan or Texas because Ian Crocker is the first guy that I know of in the swimming world. And he goes to Texas. And then coincidentally, Tom Elchow, who was an Olympic gold medalist in 2000, um, he grew up in Minnesota and a ton of his state records and high school records were still around. And I knew Tom had gone to, to Michigan. So those were kind of the two schools that I, I really had in my mind. And then Georgia kind of came out just from their impressive performance at trials. And um, I knew that they were, you know, a well-trained team, especially for the longer events. Um, so it really was down to those three schools, I think for me. Um, but after I visited, I just felt like the, the guys at Georgia and the guys at Texas were there with the teams I wanted to be on just because of the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And then it was actually John Shevitt. John Shevitt had texted me paragraphs and paragraphs about how it's such a great family, how I'd have a place on the team. He just like really made me feel wanted. Um, and I think that was just kind of the cherry on top. So that's kind of how I settled on the University of Texas. 
That's a, that's a, that's a great story. I'm honestly, my takeaway from that is I'm pretty pissed that we don't have people making documentaries like that anymore. I know. I know. So here's here. I gotta, I gotta tell you this crazy <laughs> story that has to do with this documentary. Yeah. So do you know that you've been to deep Eddie, the mm-hmm. municipal pool. Um, mm-hmm. And for people that don't know, deep Eddie is a municipal pool. It's kind of by labor Lake. And I think it was, after 2019 nationals, I was here in Austin. Uh, we weren't swimming yet, but I just kind of wanted to go there and swim for a bit. And I'm swimming laps in this. It's got to be like 28 meters. It's like a really odd yeah. length of a pool. And I like look over and I'm wearing mirrored goggles. So whenever I wear mirrored goggles, I kind of look around. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of use that to my advantage. And there's this guy that's got to be like six foot eight, six foot nine swimming in the lane next to me. And he's wearing Swedish goggles. Okay. Now, to me, that's, that's kind of like yeah, a flag. Yeah. Like, hey, that's this, how you guy, know. <laughs> this guy swam. This guy swam. Yeah. And so this guy goes, guy, because I'm wearing a Texas cap. He goes, hey, man, you swim at the University of Texas? I'm like, yeah, I do. Uh, he's like, oh, cool. I want to introduce myself. I I swam there in, you know, 2000. I think he swam like 1999 to 2002 or 2003. Um, okay. And so him and I are just talking. He's like, so where are you from? I'm like, oh, I'm from Minneapolis. He's like, oh, cool. I'm from Elmbrook, Wisconsin. I'm like, okay. So we're just like talking. He's like, so like, what are you studying? Like, how have you enjoyed your time here? Nothing like, like, nothing really swimming based, but just more kind of to get to know me. Mm -hmm. And him and I chat for a bit. He's like, all right, cool. My my name's Sean Foley, man. So if like, there's anything you ever need, just like, hopefully we'll, we'll cross paths and we'll reach out. I'm like, oh, cool. And so I didn't even think about this months go by and I'm walking through the study hall and our study hall is in the NES, which is the Northeast end zone um, in our football stadium. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking through these study hall rooms and there's like these plaques of all these like pictures of people that have um, achieved academic success to some degree. Mm -hmm. And I see this picture of this guy and I recognize him. I don't know where I recognize him. It's a picture of him when he was in college. And I, uh, I see his name and I see Sean Foley. And I put the two and two together that it's this guy that I met at the pool back in August. And for the longest time, I couldn't remember why I recognized, because I recognized him, his, his younger face than what he actually, like, in mm-hmm. present time. Mm-hmm. And then one day it just dawns on me this guy had like an excerpt and an interview in this movie unfiltered that I'd watched like when I was a kid, uh-huh. but I'm thinking like, no way that's awesome. And right about this time, big 12s is, is going on. And, and Matt Lowe, um, who does, um, I don't know if it massage therapy is the right word. He, he does massages for us, but I, don't th- I think he does more like physical therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, him and I are just chatting. Cause I mean, he's always him and I've gotten to know each other really well through swim meets over the years. And I think I just like brought up because I'm like, hey, do you know this guy, Sean Foley? And he's like, yeah, he uh, he created he's one of the co-founders of Nine Bandit Whiskey. I'm like, no way. That's that's hilarious. And like more time goes by and I'm coaching at Western Hills and he's coaching masters and and him and I talk a little bit more and, and get to know each other a little bit more. And then it was at the tower lighting this year, actually, that I actually like told him the story about recognizing <laughs> his picture and, and his video. And he goes, oh, dude, no way. I actually was one of the producers on that movie. <laughs> so it was just a crazy okay. like 360 from when I started swimming to, to where I am now. So it, it was pretty awesome. I, I That is awesome. That was a great story. But also, I feel like that's the whole swimming culture in Austin, right? Like yep. you go there. And there's so many people in swimming that you have seen their face before that, you know, and then you just kind of start getting enmeshed in this whole swimming culture. And then you start meeting all these people and you realize that, oh, they founded this company or they work here, they do that. And, uh, Austin is just such a, such a great swimming family. And I feel like that those kinds of things happen a lot there. Of course, of course. Yeah. So that dude, great story. So you, you end up going to Texas. Um, and so then getting on campus as a freshman, uh, what stood out to you? Were you surprised at all about what you had seen on your trip versus what was, was the reality your first few months there? Yeah, I would say I kind of got the feeling right away that university of Texas was a more organic 
and authentic. I didn't feel like they were putting on a show for us um, because the stuff we did on my recruiting trip was the stuff that we do every Friday or every weekend, um, like playing six square before practice all the time, uh, going to the green belt, just like the team being being together and kind of creating that culture. I think one of the biggest things that I was kind of – the craziest thing for me was I had never really been around a bunch of these stars before. And I had gotten into campus with a bunch of other people and settled in my dorm. And Ed had texted me and a couple of guys in my class like, hey, I'm, I'm coaching a workout with Clark at, at the pool. If you want to come by, you can hop in and swim and do a little bit. So, of course, I want to go in there. And I go into the locker room to change. And, you know, I look up at one of the lockers and I see one of the last names of the guys in our class. So I'm like, oh, no way. Like my locker, like I've probably been assigned my locker by now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going down the line or whatever. And all of a sudden I realized my locker is right between Jack Conger and Joe schooling, (laughs) which is just like, (laughs) I remember freaking out. I'm like, so two Olympic gold medalists, uh, an American record holder and someone who beat Michael Phelps like a summer (laughs) ago, I'm in between those two. And I mean, I'd seen all the rivalries on swim swam with the videos that you did. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just a really cool moment. So I get out there and, you know, I'm doing a couple laps and Clark gets done with this workout and Clark kind of, you know, moseys on over and I don't know, him and I have never talked before. He just looks at me and in, in typical Clark Smith fashion, he goes, I hate swimming. <laughs> Cause he just probably did some horrible workout and him and I are just talking. I don't know if that was his way of like uh, kind of breaking the ice with me and he's about to leave. I go, Oh, by the way, my, my name is JT. He's like, yeah, I know. And then just walks away. (laughs) So I think the thing that surprised me the most was, you know, these super accomplished athletes and swimmers are going to talk to everybody and they're going to be, they're not going to, they're not, they don't see themselves on a pedestal. They see you as a Texas swimmer. Mm -hmm. And that that was kind of the coolest thing that I experienced. Um, So just being able to be in workouts with, with those guys and that class just was, it was something really cool and special. (laughs) I mean, and, and also for just, you know, someone like Clark Smith, like you said, you know, huge NCAA star Olympian, just be like, yeah, I know your name, obviously. Yeah, obviously. (laughs) Yeah. It was, it was wild. It was, it was the coolest thing ever. And since then Clark and I are really great friends. So that's, I mean, that is super cool. So then the, you know, Texas culture is something that is, is legendary. And we talk about all the time in your experience, what parts of that were, were athlete driven, you know, or were like the culture is just so ingrained at that point that like the athletes kind of, they just kind of take care of it themselves. And then what parts of it were, you know, were more Eddie and Wyatt taken care of on a day to day. Definitely. I think, um, I would say most of it's athlete driven. I would say most of it's the guys, the guys are the ones that are, you know, saying team dinners on Friday, everybody be there. You know, the, the ones doing the, I mean, it's pretty well known, I think now, and, and something that's really cool for recruits to see is every Friday they do a clap meeting. So they'll clap up any like sort of accomplishment. If someone had an awesome set, if someone had an awesome, like killed a, a test, um, did well in school, certain things like that, even just personal little things that um, it's kind of, it's an opportunity for a team that's so big with 40 guys to be able to be aware of everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if I were, if we didn't have that, I wouldn't have been able to know what the spinners are doing or how the breaststrokers are doing. Cause I'm all the way down in distance. So I think that was a great way for us to, um, be a team. I think as far as Eddie and Wyatt, I think they obviously add great reminders at meets, like make sure you're up there for your teammates, maybe make sure you're shaking hands, um, with not only each other, but other teams, um, and I really think Ed has done the groundwork so much, um, you know, since he got here in 78, 79, um, because like I'll have talks with the alumni and we do a lot of the same stuff that they did, mm-hmm. but that in that aspect of like team culture. Um, and, you know, it's, I think Wyatt also does an awesome job with that. Um, you know, especially there's different eras of Texas swimming. Like, I feel like my freshman year, I was coming off the heels of um, obviously like the Jack Conger, Willa Cone, Clark Smith show. 
Mm-hmm. And I feel like that era was like from 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Yep. And then after we won that fourth NCAA title with Joe's class and Johnny Roberts class, we were on to the next era. Um, and I feel like we're kind of on that. So I feel like it goes in like five year increments, maybe, um, you know, with guys taking fifth years now because of the COVID rules, I think that that could be subject to change. Um, but I think Wyatt has done a bigger job with that culture because now we're at a point where it's just a bunch of guys that had Wyatt Collins all four years for their, as their assistant coach versus like Chris Kubik. Um, and I think Wyatt's done a good job of obviously paying homage to, to Chris and how Chris ran the team as the assistant coach, but Wyatt has also found himself and his identity and being an assistant coach. Um, so I think they obviously provide great reminders for us on, on how to take care of each other. One of Ed's biggest sayings is take care of yourself, take care of each other, and the rest will take care of itself. Um, so I think they do a great job, but I don't think the coaches force it. Um, and I think culture is always going to, culture is going to be the driving force when something goes wrong. Like motivation is never going to be there when you need it the most. So NCAA is 2019. I think how we recovered from that, that loss and how the team even dealt with it during the meet had to do with culture Um, because culture is not going to be there. It's not emotionally driven. It's, it's there. Guys are going to pick each other up um, when they don't feel like it, when people had a bad race and and being able to rely on your teammates is, is a big deal. And I think, um, I think the women's team, for example, they have had a major shift in culture like reinventing culture for their women's team. And I think that's why they had such a good NCAAs. And I think that's why they're building on that is because they're creating their own culture that's unique to them. Um, And obviously the coaches obviously need to play a part in that because I think Ed and Wyatt need to be involved with us and, you know, Carol and Mitch need to be involved with them. But I think the team's responsibilities um, of, of being a team together outside of the pool is kind of what, creates that tight knit group. Um, and I think that's why, because so many people like on other teams that different invites have come up to me and said, you know, your team just, it's just seems like you guys just have fun together. Like the guys just screw around together and have fun. And I think that's why I think that takes a lot of pressure off of people um, and learning to swim for each other. I think that's kind of, it, it doesn't become a, a selfish and a self seeking sort of a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if self-seeking is the right word, but you're swimming for something greater than yourself. And I think our team's culture, especially about the men's team is we're not swimming for the guys on the pool. We're swimming for the guys that swam in 1981. And I think that's really cool. They still root for us and we have that, that tight knit connection. Um, So I think it's really cool that our culture goes beyond just the current team. I, I really love that you brought up 2019. Um, because I vividly remember being on deck in Austin there for that meet. And on the last session, when it was, you know, very clear that Cal was going to win that meet, not only did you guys go one, two in the first event of the, or, you know, there's the mile, but then in the tuner back, mm-hmm. you guys go one, two, Shebit gets his first ever NCAA win. Yeah. Cats three, one hundreds behind him. You know, they have this like epic moment, celebratory moment. And then you guys finish that by just decimating everyone in the 400 free relay. Um, I mean, it just seemed like, it, again, like you said, you know, the culture is what, um, what kind of poises you guys to, to do that and to rise up in an occasion, even though you could just be like, well, we're not going to win. You know, what's the point? Um, you guys really seem to make the most of it, especially mm-hmm. in that situation. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, It's kind of funny. We had a lot of practice for that in the 2017, 2018 season of learning how to get motivation and create energy when you're not swimming well. Uh, We lost a ton of dual meets my freshman year. I think we we lost to Indiana and Florida, maybe in the tri meet, maybe we beat one of them. We lost to Texas A&M, which was a huge deal. Um, We lost to NC state, Arizona state, even um you know a bunch of teams that 
obviously we could have beaten, but we just had to learn how to create, like just act goofy and, and create energy and feed off of each other. Um, so I kind of remember watching 2019 NCAA as a tuner back, all the guys in the stands and all the alumni and the guys on deck just kind of went wild. Cause it's, you, you kind of, obviously the bigger win and what you had hoped for um, wasn't there, but for Austin and John to have great swims and for John to accomplish something that we've all watched him chase forever and him have a ton of heartbreaking um, races that that was all that mattered to us in the moment. Um, and that was definitely what was on my mind. Did, was there a palpable difference on the teams? I, I know this is a big question, but just throughout the season of, you know, coming off of 2018, when you guys won the title yep. um, versus 2019, when you guys got second, was, was there, did you notice a difference in the teams or was that something that was talked about a lot? Um, I mean, also obviously every team is different, so you have different leadership, but yeah. was, was, was that palpable for you at all? Yeah, I think so. I, I think it's a culture shift because 2018, like I said, we were kind of riding on the coattails of it being Joe Schoolin's team. Mm -hmm. You know, it was Jack Congers, Willa Cones, Will Glass is another one, Clark Smith. Um, and then 2019 kind of became a reinvention sort of deal when it came to team culture. I think, um, I think our biggest problem 2019 is I don't think we were present in the moment. I think we were too, we weren't doing the little things. Um, and obviously as much as we would have loved to win that, I'm only speaking for myself when I say this. Those cow guys, they work hard too. Um, I know them all pretty individually. They're they're good guys. Um, so obviously, to see like for Sean to be able to win and Trenton, um, that was awesome. It obviously stunk that it was in our home pool. <laughs> I mean that kind of that kind of made it worse. But I think I think losing 2019 obviously created um, more firepower and a deeper team chemistry and culture. Um, going into the 2020 season. Um, so, so let's, let's just talk about Texas training. You know, we hear a lot of stories about, uh, well, about things that happen in Texas practices. Um, so I'm going to, I'm just going to go down a list in your time at Texas. Who was the best kicker? Joe school with hands it. down <laughs> so like i'm talking like joe could go i'd seen joe go 107 in a long course 100 kick uh you know how we do 20 50s fly he mm -hmm. did a kick on 35 with a board <laughs> oh, God. i mean he could he could break minutes easily so hands down joe's <laughs> that's that's disgusting uh polar was there a polar clark smith that makes sense yeah clark, clark could put on a band and and beat people <laughs> Even me, even if I didn't have a band, Clark could beat me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, we, yeah, we've heard stories about his training. It's disgusting. Yeah. Um, what, is there someone who just always brought it to practice every day, no matter what? You know, I would, there's a ton that come to mind. I think Carson Foster is always on. Really? Even if Carson Foster, Carson Foster is almost always on him and I didn't train together too often. Um, but I, I don't remember seeing him die very much. Um, obviously Drew Kibler's great, great all around trainer. Um, I don't think Drew and Carson were ever put in a distance situation where they, they would die and fall on their face. Uh, Cause <laughs> obviously Eddie, they don't need to train for the distance like that. Um, I'm going to say off the top of my mind, I'm going to say Clark Smith. Carson's a great trainer too. Mm -hmm. There's a ton I'm probably missing right now, just off, off the cusp. Um, I'd say Jack Collins. Okay. Also, I did a lot of training with Jack Collins and, and Jeff Newkirk also. Um, obviously, I, th I think the biggest thing for me is what takes a good trainer. It doesn't matter if they're always on, if they're always swimming fast, mm -hmm. because you can't, the sport's not about practice, but the guys that are pushing it, even when they don't feel good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just naming people that like those five guys that I named are people that don't 
you know, take workouts off. <laughs> mm-hmm. So. Gotcha. Uh, is there, you know, you, you swam with a lot of guys, like you said, there's 40 plus guys on the team every year. Is there an unsung hero that comes to mind for, for practices who, who, someone who can really train with someone we might not notice at a meet necessarily? Let me think about that. There's a couple, I wish I had more experience with some of the sprinters and some of the guys that do Mm -hmm. the strokes. You know what? I don't know why I haven't mentioned this guy, Jake Foster. Jake Foster is hundred percent the best trainer I've ever swam with hands down. I don't know what it is about Jake, like not to take anything away from the guys I already mentioned. I don't know Mm -hmm. why I forgot Jake Foster. It's hundred percent Jake Foster. (laughs) And Jake Foster is a fast swimmer. I don't think he's yeah. even close to what he could be. I don't think his times fairly represent the, the swims he could have. Mm-hmm. Um, but hands down, Jake Foster. I don't know why that didn't even come to mind. <laughs> what, is, is there something particularly crazy you've seen Jake do in practice before? I mean, Jake, I don't get to swim because he's a breaststroker. So him and I aren't doing the same workouts. <laughs> Um, and I am workouts. I don't know what it is, but there have been times and this, it's always frustrating when you're a freestyler and you swim with guys that aren't really freestylers, but can swim freestyle really well. Uh huh. And if I'm next to Jake, like, I know I gotta be like on my game Uh huh. and I'd say Jake probably would beat me more often than I'd beat him even on freestyle. Um, you know, Jake especially has a super aerobic base because Jake can do the thousand really well. Right. I think I'm pretty sure he broke nine minutes at a dual meet. So <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's just willpower, but Jake Foster. That's that's good. And let's let's give context to the situation. You at your senior NCAAs, you went four thirteen in the 500. Yep. OK, so, you, yeah, it's like you're 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 a very legit distance swimmer. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, seeing Jake Foster do the two, I am the two breast and then go up and swim the thousand. It's like, wait, hold on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this exactly. is supposed to happen. <laughs> exactly. If he, I mean, if he keeps working on backstroke the way he's working on backstroke, he's, I think he's going to have a really good four. I am. I, I certainly hope so for him. Um, do you have, do you have, a wildest thing you've seen in a Texas practice before something that just completely blew your mind. Here, here's the problem. I think I've grown so accustomed to like <laughs> wild things happening that I kind of overlook a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Sam Pomayevich doing, you know, 68 or however many fifties fly on 35 was something. Um, I think that's a tough one. I mean, any recent invites and stand up sets are always wild. There's always a record going down of some mm-hmm. sort. Um, so obviously seeing Clark swim those distance races were were pretty wild. Uh, I mean, I've seen Carson get, go a 418 and work out in a 500 off the blocks. Um, I'm trying to think, you know, there. I think Austin Katz is another one. We didn't mm-hmm. swim very much together because he did backstroke. Yeah. But that man was always pushing himself to the, the brink of throwing up and he would. <laughs> like there was no question that he was working hard enough. <laughs> um I'm trying to, I mean, there are just so many guys that yeah. obviously are, are going so fast that you don't even like are able to process it. Mm-hmm. So Okay. So, so let me pinpoint this. What's, what's the wildest thing you've ever done in practice or, or what's, what's a practice that stands out to you at Texas as like, this was, this might've been my best. This is, I might've peaked. Yeah. I don't remember the set exactly. I remember going like a couple 48 to 47 from a push. I, there was one day in maybe January after winter training, uh, I did a 2000 and I don't know what I went. I want to say I went eight. I went 18 something for a push and a brief. And it just happened to be my day. Sometimes other guys are on in distance group. That happened to be my day that I was, I was going fast. I wish I could remember what I went because it was something really, it was something that I was like, okay, I'm ready for. 
NCAA, Big 12s, NCAAs. Um, I think one crazy thing we did was we did one of the first practices I did, we did like 2100s hold like 50 point or 51 on like two minutes. Okay. That was yeah. why that's when Clark was in like peak distance shape. And I just think I just will powered my way up to swimming that fast, but that was, that's probably the most impressive. Those are probably the two most impressive. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, that seems pretty good. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you, you, you swam distance your whole Texas career, which I feel like a lot of college swimmers do not make it for four years. Mm-hmm. I mean, generally, some college swimmers don't make it for four years period, but especially training distance. I mean, that's, that's pretty grueling. What, what, what kept your heart in it? What kept you going? What kept you interested in, in, in swimming well, that much? Yeah. So this is kind of interesting. So there's kind of this joke that Clark Smith breaks people mm-hmm. like distance swimmers because he's just so far ahead of people. And if you're just getting, if you're just working hard and he's like, you have the best practice ever and he has an off day, he's still going to kick your butt. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a really funny question. So I actually, this is kind of fun fact. I started the mile freshman year and then I didn't have a very good NCAA blaze or at least the level I wanted. I don't know if that just has to go with being a freshman. Um, so when I got back, I really like started pounding the workouts And I kind of, to my own fault, I didn't understand it at the time, but I started overworking myself. I started taking pride in doing workouts with Clark Smith. And Mm -hmm. it got to a point where my 2018, 2019 season started going like in the wrong direction. I just wasn't like dropping as much time. I couldn't finish races. I don't know what it was. I did at the time. I didn't know what it was. And the summer came and I came up to Wisconsin for a meet because my dad was doing Summerfest, which is a music festival. Okay. I thought, okay, I'll go up there and swim this, this like sectional level meet. My old club's there. My brother's there. This would be awesome. And I swam a long course 100 free and I went 53 seconds, which for me, I mean, that, that's something I could have done from a push. And that's mm-hmm. when I started noticing that something was wrong. And I came back to Austin. I kind of thought I needed a break. But I don't know. I think just being back here, I just kind of felt motivated. I swam a 200 long course fly. I took the 200 fly out in 59 seconds. And then the second 100 was 110. So I went 209. And I, I mean, I'm not much of a flyer, but I, I could have been, I had been like 204 or whatever in the mm-hmm. past. And I just remember just feeling so defeated. I told Ed and Wyatt, I'm like, yeah, I need a break from swimming no like intention of how long that would be or what that was. Um, so I actually came home to Minnesota for about five weeks and didn't swim at all. I've been doing a ton of tests with our, um, our trainers and stuff, just trying to figure it. It was like, I wore something that would monitor my sleep, just mm-hmm. kind of figuring out why I felt so bad in my heart rate. And right around the time that I was home, I started wearing this thing called a whoop. Um, which in 2019, it was kind of big. It wasn't that big. Um, and by the time I got home, I remember being out on a boat on a lake with my friend and I got notified from Terry that I was, um, feeling I had, I don't know what the official scientific name for, but I was essentially diagnosed with being overtrained. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, finally I have a rhyme and reason to why I wasn't feeling good in races and why I was mentally burned out. So I came home. I didn't touch the pool for five or six weeks. I watched nationals from my laptop in my room. My family and my brother went there to get to go to the meet, but I stayed home. I just didn't want anything to do with the sport at all. Mm -hmm. And I'm wearing this whoop and it's monitoring my sleep. And I start realizing, I start learning about my body. Importantly enough, I went home and I like redid everything when it comes to diet, even. So I like really made sure I was eating, you know, complete meals. I was doing it at this time in the morning, this time at lunch, this time at dinner, Mm -hmm. same time, making sure I'm getting like the right vitamins from food. Um, I'm a vegetable guy. This sounds weird, but I'm not a big fruit guy. Mm -hmm. So just eating like fruit again, 
uh, getting good protein, staying hydrated and actually sleeping. Cause I'd always thought, you know, in college, when you're, you go to bed at 10 and you wake up at, at six, you're in bed for eight hours. So you got eight hours of sleep, but in reality, you're only getting six and a half. So I'd be getting like six, six and a half hours of sleep, go in the morning, uh, getting worked by Clark Smith in distance group and Eddie. Yeah. And then I like lift these big weights. Um, that was another big thing. I like went up in weight just because I, I'm naturally, I, I gain a lot of muscle pretty quickly. So I just, my body was just like swollen to where it shouldn't be. So I went home and I finally got my sleep on the right track. I got my hydration. I got my food on the right track. Things started looking up. Um, and I think invite happened. I swam well. Invite went great. Um, Big 12 still went pretty good. We were in West Virginia that year. So it was kind of a different year. Um, I obviously didn't get the results I wanted, um, which was okay. But I just, I had to learn about recovery and sleep and nutrition and um, just being overtrained. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would go home, I'd eat dining hall at five o'clock and then I would make more dinner. I'd have a second dinner. I'd have two lunches and two dinners that entire year just because I needed more calories. I just wasn't getting what I needed. Um, so I had to like start from zero and from scratch again with my body. And, you know, since then I've kind of heard about a lot of other athletes that have kind of come out and talked about being overtrained. I don't know the, I don't know Simone Manuel personally. I don't know um, her situation, but I had heard there might've been some articles or she had talked about feeling overtrained. Mm -hmm. So I just think, it's kind of like the new thing in the future. And I think whoop is obviously a big contributor with that. Um, so it's just really important that for people to understand their bodies, what might work for me might not work for you. And it's all kind of unique to who you are. That's that, that is great insight. Um, and uh, again, yeah, something a lot of people might not even realize or certainly not think about, you know, I think when people think about swimming for four years, it's just like, well, yeah, I just go and I'm with this team and, it's four years and that's that. And you don't, you don't think about the life happening, right. Or, or just mm -hmm. the different variables that can come up or, um, yeah, it's like, I, I never knew that about you, but that's, that's really interesting. And, um, distance swimming is really taxing. Swimming is really taxing, right. Um, yeah. you know, but, but distance swimming, especially <laughs> that I totally get how that something like that could happen especially when you're competing every day with a guy like Clark Smith. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so then, you know, kind of moving into your senior year, um, you did, did you feel the effects of that kind of coming together and really working for you in the pool by that time? Yeah, I think so. 2019 to 2020 was kind of the time that I learned to reset my body. Mm -hmm. But then it wasn't until, you know, when COVID hit that I actually kind of learned to reset my mind and maybe change my priorities. Um, so something I didn't mention earlier. So Texas is obviously in recent years, a big team with a lot of fast guys. And in 2019, um, myself and three other swimmers, Jack Collins, Josh Hartman and Andrew Kustik did not make the cut for the the spot on the NCAA team. Mm -hmm. um, and that was something really frustrating for all four of us. I think Jack and I kind of used each other kind of therapeutically just to be able to express that frustration of, Hey, you do all the right things. You work hard, but you still don't get to make this cut mm -hmm. um, to be at this, especially in Austin. That's tough to not be able to, to be a part of that. Um, so I just think going into that spring, I was working even harder. I just pushed my body to the brink. My body said no. Well, 2019, 2020, I kind of felt like I learned my lesson. Like, all right, this is the time that I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to get there and I'm going to go to NCAAs and we're on kind of this revenge tour where we're mm -hmm. going to light up the, and kind of make a statement and kind of vindicate that meet we had last year. Um, and the roster came out, they said it, and I didn't make the cut again. So it's like, okay, I went to the drawing board for the third time and it didn't work out. And I just remember being frustrated. Um, 
just like the other guys. And I don't know. I just, it was, I think it was the right call for me to not go just because we're other guys, but obviously it still hurts. Um, and so I just remember dealing with that frustration for a few days. And I'm like, look, I'm not going to let this change who I am again. I'm not going to find identity in this sport because it's not going to reward me. It's, it's not going to give me what I think I'm worth. Um, so I remember just sitting in my room, like when I had found out the news, when Wyatt had told me um, and just being frustrated and just being like, all right, God, you have a plan. I'm sure of it. Something's going to happen. I don't know what it is. And I know like, no swim meets ever going to give me that fulfillment that I'm going to need. Well, not even three or four days, days later, the world's hit with this pandemic and COVID hits. We find out the, there's like rumors that NCAAs are going to be canceled and women's NCs, it becomes like no spectators. And then right. their meet gets canceled and then our meet gets canceled and that's it. And all of a sudden, I have like an entire team feeling the same way that I felt a few days ago. And I still feel it with them because that's frustrating. Um, you know, I had, I'd gotten over myself and I'd look forward to seeing a bunch of guys swim and train hard or they had trained hard and see them swim fast. And all of a sudden everybody and everything, not just swimming is reduced to no identity in anything in the world. You're living in your house. So, I mean, I, I'd gone back for five weeks. I had, got myself into a routine of running again. I lost a ton of weight, kind of the same thing that I'd done in 2019, but this time more mental. And we had come back, the, the coaches had said, Hey, we're going to be able to swim. You guys can come back. And we're like, okay, this is sweet. So we come back to Austin. Um, important detail of this, uh, Dean Ferris, who had been training at Texas was one of my roommates. Um, so Dean, Dean had never left. I don't think he had stayed in Texas. Okay. So it was kind of cool, like me and my brother and, and Dean come back and we start swimming at Austin Swim Club and there kind of becomes this hot spot of all these college athletes from Austin that go to different schools like Cal, Georgia Tech, ASU, the Navy, um, you know, just schools that and people that I probably wouldn't have talked to if I hadn't had that awesome opportunity. Well, Waterloo Swimming had opened up and a bunch of the Texas guys had moved over there. Um, Eddie thought, you know, it's probably best that I go train with those guys because I'm a distance swimmer. Um, but I was just so in love with the atmosphere that we had going on with those guys of swimming like an hour and a half in the morning. Um, and then kind of having my whole day that just didn't work out. So this is kind of, this is one of the nice things about it and why it, um, nothing's in stone. Anything's up to subject to change. Um, and the coaches actually give us a say in to be able to advocate for our own swimming. And at the time I was keeping myself busy, just doing classes in the Waterloo schedule coincidentally just didn't work out for me. And I, I told Ed, I'm like, Hey, I, I know there's frustration about why I'm not coming to swim with the team. But I think my brother was even swimming with the team, but except for like me, um, I think Willa Cohn was still swimming at Austin swim club, Sam Pomayevich and then Dean Ferris, and then just a bunch of other people on different teams. And I said, hey, I think this is good for me. Um, I'm going to stay in shape. I promise something will work out. And Ed kind of, like, trusted me, and that was probably the best summer of my life. Um, Jack Dunworth, who swims at the Navy, and then Nick Carlson, who swims at Arizona State. Um, I developed, like, lifelong friendships with them that I'll have forever. I mean, I, I got to do a ton of things. Like, I started playing golf. Dean Ferris, I don't know if you knew this, Dean Ferris is a really good golfer. Of like course people, he is. <laughs> he's just naturally athletic. Um, <laughs> people that understand golf better than I do say, like, no, Dean could play college golf. For sure, Division three and Division two, But mm -hmm. he's just that good, and he can just drive really well. Um, so I really just had a summer of fun. Mm -hmm. I just, like, kept my, my touch, my feel of the water. Um, I thought I was in good shape was not the case when I got back <laughs> and I started getting beat by everybody, but, um, I just felt like mentally refreshed. I just felt like emotionally I was in a good place. Um, I went out of my comfort zone and exposed myself to new people. Um, it was a great return. I spent a lot of time in the sun, just swimming outdoors. Um, but then, I mean, we would go boating during the day. We played golf at night. It was just, it was like I was on vacation and it's something I never got to experience because of college. And then, um, 
you know, we got back in shape and after a month of training, I went the best time in the mile by like 11 seconds. <laughs> and like, that is just kind of like not heard of with distance <laughs> swimming. You need like half, like you got to put a lot of training in it. But I really just think it was just cause I was so, I got my physical rest, but then I, I got my emotional and mental rest back. And I yeah. think that it was just the two summers back to back over time. And, um, I think that just gives me a greater appreciation of, of, of finding that balance. That's a great story, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I remember come doing a practice in pancakes at, at, uh, at Austin swim. Club oh yeah. 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 I summer. totally forgot about that. Yeah. It, that was, that was great. It seemed like such a Mecca. It was so cool just to, to see all of those different colleges represented and, and training together. Yep. Um, it was such a cool thing. Um, and so, yeah, so then you move into your senior season and, um, you're refreshed, you go best time in the mile. Um, yeah. and then you make, you, you make NCAAs. I know it, it was wild. I think, um, Another important thing to add to the story. Um, so Drew Kibler, one of my best friends, um, Drew kind of was like on a hiatus that entire summer. He went back home, hmm. never came back to Austin. Didn't come back to Austin until like September or August. He just kind of was in his, his own zone and his own space. Um, and, you know, he had came back and um, he had kind of gotten that refreshing re-identify like re like new identity from taking time off away from the sport just being with you know friends back home that him and I really connected even more so over that and I think just being surrounded by Drew and then there were a ton of other guys um the Fosters or, or other ones just I was just so I was surrounded by a ton of positive people people that were really upbeat um that it kind of made me excited to race and excited to try to do things like um, Carson Foster going for that four IM record, David Johnston, like, uh, going for the national age group record, just like little things like that, just seeing their excitement, it kind of wore off on me. And I just carried that into October and then into invite and then big twelves. And then obviously, yeah, just waiting to hear if I had made that team. Um, I had kind of decided, I was like, all right, either I'm going to the blazer or I'm done swimming. I had a great big 12s. I won a couple best times. Um, But I don't think I'm going to let some end result, like determine something outside of me, like say, all right, this is how you're done with the sport. So I texted and Wyatt and said, hey, um, I don't know what the process is and the selection criteria for the meet. I'm going to keep training just because of the events I do. I'm going to swim with the NCAA guys that are for sure going. Um, and if you don't select me, that's fine. We had a great run, but I, I'm just going to stop swimming. And I'm, I'm going to fold because I, I just was content with what I had made. Um, they both said, okay, sounds good. And they said, so we have a lot to think about. So it might take some time. So I go, okay. And I started getting back in shape. Um, just swimming with Alex Zettel and David Johnston because they were the distance swimmers that were going. One day I come into practice and go, Ed just goes, he's alone. He goes, Hey JT, uh, you're the 18th guy. You're going. I'm like, all right, cool. And <laughs> so, um, why came up and talked to me? Cause they both know kind of the emotional frustration of not being able to go. And if they had it, they would take everybody. It's nothing personal. It really is just business and strategy and, and math. Right. Um, so I just remember being like, sweet this is cool and i remember diving in and thinking about it like hey this is everything you've you've wanted you're finally going back to ncaa's it's been since 2018 uh, this is gonna be your last meet and i don't know i just didn't feel like i felt fulfilled you know mm-hmm. from reaching that milestone but it really just came with i know this sounds super cliche but it was the journey and the friendships i made on the team um the relationship with the coaches and just felt good to be able to do numbers again and kind of train over spring break. And there was one day, this is kind of segueing into another story. We do, we were doing like fast stuff. They like segmented like numbers and fast and, and uh, how we do, how they kind of taper us. 
and it was like the the last one of the last days i mean i think it was like a friday and we were leaving for NCAAs on a monday okay and it was just ed and i in the pool we're over by the starting he's sitting on a chair and i come up to ed and i go hey ed he's like do you need something i'm like i got a feeling this is your last NCAAs. i said don't say anything that's just my feeling I didn't look at him I because we were just standing next to each other and I just walked away. Uh-huh. And I mean, sure enough, like a week later, he announces to the team that he's, uh, he's done. I came there and I, I'd always joked. Um, I was like, when I leave this sport, I'm taking Eddie Reese and Clark Smith with me. <laughs> now the parallel to that, since Eddie's coaching again, I probably should make a comeback. So, but I don't know. I can't make any promises with that. Um, <laughs> But I just felt like I was really in the moment and present. I just, I feel like I was able to appreciate Eddie for who he is and Wyatt for what he meant to me. Um, and then the guys, and I think I was just finally able to swim for Texas and not swim for myself. Um, didn't have any expectations, win or loss. I had just, I had done what I, I needed to do. And um, because of that, I had a great meet. Yeah. Yeah, you, you went a huge best time in your 500. Uh, did you go best time in your other events also? I think I was maybe – I think I had like the tuner free of my life at Big 12, so I think I was just okay. slightly off that. Yeah. Um, but then the 1650, I was just kind of – I knew it was my last race ever, let alone my last mile. Uh-huh. And um, we had kind of done the math. We don't like doing the math the last day for what the team race is. Mm-hmm but we knew we were kind of in a good spot and had just had came up to me and it's just like, I need to see something here. (laughs) And, and when this legend kind of puts that on you, I'm like, all right, I guess I'm going to do something here (laughs) because I don't want to let him down. And I'm going to be honest. I don't really remember the mile that much. I remember Mm -hmm. starting to build it. The one thing I do remember is with about, 300 yards later left Wyatt was standing on the side and Wyatt just put up the horns. Like that was it. And he just like pointed mm-hmm. at me and it followed me. And I just felt like I, I just kind of had the support of just like Texas swimming and all the alums. And I just, I finished it. I had a great race and I think it was the best way to end my career. That's awesome, man. <laughs> that sounds, that yeah. sounds great. <laughs> it was kind of poetic. <laughs> no kidding. <clears throat> Dang. Uh, so, and then now here we are. You're working at Dell. Do, are you, do you swim at all still? Okay. Funny story. Nick Carlson, one of the, one of the guys that I met at AC. Um, I like running. I like working out. Um, he's really into triathlons or he's, he's starting to get into triathlons. So he's like, Hey, we should go swim masters at 6 AM or 5 45 AM. And I committed for the month. And one of the days he didn't even show up. <laughs> so I was just there alone. <laughs> But um, I'm kind of worried because that's, you know, I'm already running and I'm starting to swim again. If I start biking, I'm going to be doing triathlons. And if I'm doing triathlons, I'm going to take it seriously. And I'm going to go full in because I'm like a tunnel vision guy. I'm either all in or not at all. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, that's definitely a little worrisome for me. Um, But, you know, someone I haven't talked about enough that I kind of want to mention that has to do with me swimming kind of is Ian Crocker. So, um, I kind of mentioned in the beginning, Ian was a huge kind of like a childhood hero to me. And, um, I had gotten the opportunity to, to coach with him and I've actually met a ton of like my heroes in the sport. Um, and Ian's the only one that like turned out better than I thought. Like, obviously you meet a, a couple people and you could meet them on a bad day. Um, mm. but Ian's just the most genuine guy ever. Um, it just kind of, it was kind of, it just kind of clicked where I was finishing my career. I kind of had him waiting for me at uh, the finish of my career to obviously say he's proud of me. So just to have my childhood hero say he's proud of me, not only for the swimmer I am, but the person I am um, was really, really special. Like after I finished my career, him and I got Cisco's at breakfast, like everything was normal. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously starting to, you can kind of see the guitars in the back that that buttercream one, like 
I traded it to Ian because he, he was going to fix something for me. And he just has been bringing me guitars of his own because Ian's really into guitars and I'm kind of getting into the hobby. So I think it's just really cool that I have that to share with him because a lot of people don't get to have that relationship with their childhood idol. But um, to have Ian there for me as I made that transition from being like this collegiate swimmer for arguably the best program in college sports history with the winningest coach being Eddie Reese, him and I have that connection. We're obviously in different generations, um, but to be able to have that connection with him and that friendship um, and that support meant the world. And I, I think that's the only reason I've, I've made it um, even survive this, this transition. So I'm forever in debt to Ian Crocker and I'm going to pay him back one day. I don't know how, but I'm going to think of something that, yeah, let's get a couple. I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll chime in with my two cents on Ian Crocker. You said it best. One of the, one of the most genuine guys you'll ever meet. He, he, he really is better than, than, you know, what you could envision for him. He also hand makes guitars. Yeah. His, his hobby is building guitars with his hands, <laughs> which is just crazy to me. Yeah. Did I tell you what he gave me? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think Ian would care that I, I shared this, but you know, I'd finished NCAAs and I graduated and Ian goes, Hey, I, I got something for you. I want to give you. I was like, okay, cool. He goes, I'll bring it uh, like Monday. Mm -hmm. And obviously like some days go by and he's like, oh, oh shoot. I, I forgot to bring that thing. And it's just like a couple of weeks go by. And then one day I come in, um, I think it was to coach. Cause I started coaching masters. Okay. Um, yeah. And he had just finished coaching the group before. And he goes, oh, come with me. I'm like, okay, we go into the office. And sitting there is this 1965 Fender twin reverb amp. This thing's massive. He goes, I want you to have it. Now, this isn't just like some ordinary amp. This is like the like top tier best amp, vintage amp you could like get. And he goes, I, it's just, I want you to have it. I was just like, sweet. <laughs> like, <laughs> thank you. But I, I just like, it was so awesome to be able to like, I don't know, share that kind of as, as I transition. And I mean, I play it every day. Um, it's just, it, it's something cool that I'll have forever. And I actually want him to sign it. Um, so if I ever pass it down, but um, yeah, he's, he is a class act and he deserves the world. I, I really agree. And also, you know, obviously if you couldn't tell, he's like, if you're ever around Ian, you will find yourself talking about music one way or the other, which, yeah. which I also really, really yep. enjoy. <laughs> we had some good conversations that night, all of us, you yeah. included. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it was, it was a very fun deck to be on. Um, well, JT, it's always great talking to you. Thank you so much. We're for, for, for sharing your perspective on your swim career on, on the Texas men's swimming. Um, any parting thoughts for our audience before we sign off today? Hook them horns. That's all I got to <laughs> say. Um, I don't know. I, I think obviously all, all, all these experiences are my own. Um, I've got nothing but love and respect and I feel like I got a home through the Texas men's swim team, not only with my generation, but four generations that came before me. And um, Eddie created that. And because of Eddie, we all have that, that really cool connection, not only in Austin um, or even the States, but the world. And I'm forever in debt to Eddie and Wyatt too, for, for giving me a chance and allowing me to be a part of probably the most important thing I've ever done in my life. So I'm thankful for that. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.